evening to those of you in this room and in the theater watching on closed circuit television. It's a big crowd tonight. I'm Deborah Leff. I'm director of the Kennedy Library. And on behalf of the library and of John Chaddock, the CEO of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, I welcome you to this evening's forum on political humor. I'd also like to let you know that the forum is co-sponsored by WBUR, Boston.com, the Boston Globe, the Boston Foundation, Boston Capital, and the Lowell Institute. There is, of course, a reason why the Kennedy Library would have such an affinity for the subject of political humor. Let's take a look. I uh, spoke a year ago today to take the inaugural, and I'd like to paraphrase a couple of statements I made that day by saying that we observe tonight not a celebration of freedom, but a victory of party. For we have sworn to pay off the same party debt. Our forebears ran out nearly a year and three months ago. <laughs> Our deficit will not be paid off in the next hundred days. Nor will it be paid off in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, <laughs> nor perhaps even in our lifetime on this planet, but let us begin. Feeling in some quarters, sir, that big business is using the stock market slump as a means of forcing you to come to terms with business. One reputable columnist, uh, after talking to businessmen, obviously, reported this week their attitude is, now we have you you where they want you. Have you seen any reflection of this attitude? I can't believe I'm where business, big business wants me. I have said, and I think more than once, that heads of government should not go to the summit to negotiate agreements, but only to approve agreements negotiated at a lower level. Now it's being said and written that you're going to eat those words and uh, go to a summit without any... Uh, agreement at a lower level. Has your position changed, sir? Well, I'm going to have a dinner for all the people who've written it, and we'll see who eats uh, what. Uh... <laughs> uh, Congressman Alger of Texas today criticized uh, Mr. Salinger as a, quote, young and inexperienced White House publicity man, end quote. <laughs> I questioned the advisability of having him visit the Soviet Union. I wonder if you have any comments. I know there are always some people who feel that Americans are always uh, young and inexperienced and foreigners are always uh, able and tough and great negotiators, but I don't think that the United States acquired its present position of leadership uh, if that uh, view were correct. Now, he also, as I saw the press, said that Mr. Salinger's main job was to uh, increase uh, my standing in the Gallup poll. Having done that, he's now moving on uh, to... <laughs> when I was thinking about running for the United States Senate, I went to the then Senator Smathers and said, George, what do you think? He said, don't do it. Can't win. It's bad year. <laughs> In 1956, I was at the Democratic Convention, and I said, uh, I didn't know whether I'd run for vice president or not. So I said, uh, George, what do you think? This is it. They need a young man. Your chance. So I ran and lost. <laughs> and in 1960, I was wondering whether I ought to run in the West Virginia primary. Don't do it. That state you can't possibly carry. And actually, the only time I really got nervous about the whole matter at uh, Los Angeles was just before the balloting. George came up and said, I think it looks pretty good for you. <laughs> Stage. Very awesome. 
Yeah. Uncharacteristically, uncharacteristically on the right, we have the even-handed, always temperate, author of Rush Limbaugh is a Big Fat Idiot, comedian Al Franken. Yeah. <laughs> a Harvard graduate, Mr. Franken is probably best known for his work on Saturday Night Live. He anchored Comedy Central's Indecision 92 and was pretty good in those performances at the White House Correspondents' Dinner in 1994 and 1996. One of the people who would have been there is the person to Jeff's right. That is Helen Thomas, former White House correspondent for UPI, and the person who closed each White House press conference with the words, thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> Helen began covering President Kennedy in November 1960, and she's covered every president since that time. She's the author of Thanks for the Memories, Mr. President, Wit and Wisdom in the Front Row of the White House, and she'll be shamelessly hawking and signing that book after this forum, along with Al Franken, who'll be shamelessly hawking and signing his. <laughs> Arriving at the last minute, just to show that Republicans can be funny, Senator Al Simpson is joining us. <laughs> Look at me. Um, Senator Simpson served wonderfully in Congress as the U.S. Senator representing Wyoming from 1979 to 1997, including 10 years as the Republican Whip and Chairman of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs. And bringing this all together, good luck, Jeff, is uh, our moderator, CNN senior analyst, Jeff Greenfield. Jeff actually, despite his age, worked for Robert Kennedy, remarkably enough, as what he characterized to me as a junior, junior aide, but also a speechwriter, worked on the campaign trail. He served as a political and media analyst for ABC News, where I had the privilege of working with him at Nightline. And at CNN, you can often see him guest hosting on Larry, Larry King Live and moderating town meetings. So, Jeff, over to you. Thank you. Um, it's great to see so many people out on a night like this, but, you know, it does remind me, whenever I see this many people from Boston gathered on a night in October, I realize it's another year the Red Sox are in the World Series. So, you know, it's kind of familiar. I want to just set the... Uh, just a couple of notions and then have this as a conversation with many interruptions. Ultimately, you have your chance at these mics. I've always thought of humor as the nitroglycerin of politics. It is very powerful. It is very dangerous. It has to be handled with great care. Used correctly, it can change a campaign, as when Franklin Roosevelt in 1944 mockingly defended the honor of his Scotch Terrier Falla from the imprecations of the Republicans and effectively ended the campaign, or as you saw in the hands of a President Kennedy or a President Reagan. Uh, we didn't, this is the Kennedy Library, so we didn't have the clip of Ronald Reagan essentially putting away Walter Mondale in 1984 in that second debate by promising not to criticize his opponent's youth and experience. It's a perfect example of political judo. You take what's a weakness, you, you put a light touch, and you flip it. On the other hand, I can think of at least two cabinet members who lost their jobs because of ill-timed quips, one an obnoxious racist phrase uttered by Earl Butts, the other a kind of condescending dismissal of women and minorities on the part of James Watt. There's a governor of Texas who became an ex-governor of Texas, Clady Williams, I believe, by making a mocking reference to rape when he ran against Ann Richards. And just today, I finished John McCain's latest memoir where he tells a story of trying to be lighthearted to a bunch of Arizona college kids his first time out in the Senate, referring to the senior citizens. He said, we want you people to vote as often as those people do over in seizure world. <laughs> Funny line, he spent the next three days apologizing to the considerable senior citizen population of Arizona. So, <laughs> those are just some preliminary notes. What I want to do now is turn to this panel and talk both about people who employ politics who are in the public life and people who employ humor to talk about people in public life. And I just want to start off with a couple of short answer questions. Senator Simpson, who was the funniest president you ever heard of the people you served with? Well, Ronald Reagan had the most amazing sense of humor and whenever Nancy would go off to Scottsdale to visit her father, he would call 
several of us who loved great tales, the Dale Bumpers, uh, Hal Heflin, uh, a tailor from Missouri, and we'd go over to the White House and just sit around and tell stories for about three hours. And he loved that. He, he loved stories. He was, he was very humorous. He had good timing. He loved it. Who was the least naturally funny president you knew? Well, of course, <laughs> Jimmy Carter was a, a man who, who superbly tried and did not achieve, and, and he, in his sense of, and, and I think it's wonderful to see. He only won the Nobel. Huh? Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say that, I'll tell you. But uh, he. It uh, wasn't the Nobel for humor. No, no, it, it, it wasn't. <laughs> You're absolutely correct. He, he just, it, it, it kind of threw him off when you, when you came into him with a, with a joke. He didn't like anything off color, certainly, and he was, that was... And that ruled any of your... It took everything out of mine. <laughs> there was nothing left for me, that's for damn. Yes, well... Other... Now, you, uh, people often cite Jimmy Carter. The other person cited, and maybe, maybe, I'm not sure if you were... There at the time, I know Helen was, I'll ask her, Richard Nixon is not someone who we generally think of as Im gifted with a rollicking sense of humor. Fair enough? Scratch the word rollicking. <laughs> no, he's, he didn't have a rollicking sense of humor. He had a sense of humor, but it was so acerbic, I think he was afraid to use it in public. It really came across very mean. Which raises an interesting point. He loved a good anti-Semitic joke. He really did. <laughs> if you could put kike in a joke, Nixon. No one enjoyed a good kike joke better than, no. than Dick Nixon. He was, he was better on the press. He once said uh, <laughs> it was only coincidental that we're talking about pollution to his cabinet when the press walks in. Yeah, like I say, not a rollicking sense of humor. <laughs> But there's a, there, one of the things that strikes me, Alan, is that politicians, it seems to me, really love self-deprecating humor because it's a way to sort of, you know, I'm not wearing a top hat, I'm not a big shot. But there are people, some of your former colleagues, uh, we might even get to them by name, whose sense of humor, to use Helen's words, is indeed a Serbic, who have incredibly funny and pretty sharp things to say about other people. He's the one. Is that oh, an... Oh, no. You're not bad, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, when he's talking about the press, he's very funny. Well, that's, the, of course, they, they deserve to be punched around. I love that. <laughs> but uh, but the, Ted Kennedy is the master of self-deprecating humor. No one, no one I ever worked with is better than Ted. In the midst of all the heat, he can come up with something that just throws everybody off. He's, he's the master of the game. It seems to me also there are people in the Senate who have wonderful sense of humor, but we don't know it. They won't let them see it, or we don't appreciate it. Or maybe it's because it's cutting. I've always thought that Fritz Hollings has one of the sharpest tongues in the Senate, but it's not self-deprecating. It's other people deprecating. Well, it's when he asked Sam Donaldson about his hairpiece that was pretty bad. Uh, you, you may remember uh, that Donaldson was interviewing him, he said, and he had him set up. He said, uh, Mr. Hollings, you're from textile state. I know that. And, and you, you promote, oh, yes, I do. And I notice, I, I, they tell me you get your suits from Hong Kong. Is this true? Do you get your suits from Hong Kong? And old Fritz sat there. He said, I get my suits to the same place you get your hair peeled. <laughs> <laughs> and Sam went like this. You know? And that was the end of that. Well, that's a classic example of a counterpunch. I mean, if you get hit first, it seems to me that you are... You are he permitted. had to apologize to his mother for his attacks on the press. Well, you were after me day and night. And I, <laughs> I, that's how I had to throw Helen off. She said, how do you explain that? And I said, my mother has already talked to me, Helen. She said, oh, how do you get away with that? Before I turn to Justice Franken, <laughs> have you, Senator Simpson, ever had the occasion to say something that you were in public that you regarded as quite funny and then found yourself having to take back a day or two later? I have had my size foot 15 feet in my mouth more times than anyone could ever imagine. But every time I lost my sense of humor, I got in a lot of trouble, put it that way. I don't remember any specific thing. I never made racist uh, stories mm -hmm. or, or stories like that to have the power to hurt. 
and so do you know cute stories about somebody else. Uh, all humor is serious. And when you hear a person saying something and then saying, ha, 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 I was just kidding, forget it. They were setting the shiv. And, and, and when they say it's just humor, forget, just ignore that. Well, that's the laugher of the century. So uh, I can remember, uh, you know, I don't remember times when I, all I remember is that when I lost my humor, I got clobbered. Now, Al, I want to, you can take this wherever you want to, and you will. But one of the things, one of the things I want to try to link up is that politicians set great store by proving that they have senses of humor. That's why a lot of them go on IMIS to prove that, by God, they can take a joke, too. And yet we know that there are talented, well-known comic writers and comedians who are, who are asked by these politicians to make them funny when they say, go to a White House correspondence dinner or go on Letterman or Leno. You have had this experience of being called, yes? Yes. <laughs> yes, I have. Okay. I'll do this like a lawyer. And Mr. Franken. Yes? Because lawyers know how to do this. Three years of law school taught me this. I can't recall <laughs> every instance. Perhaps this will refresh your memory, Mr. Franken. As someone who has been asked by the people on whose side you find yourself, like your Clintons, your Rodham Clintons, your Gore Clintons, to make them funny. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps if he changed his name, he'd be president today. Who knows? Does it give you any pause that you are lending your rollicking sense of humor to people to make them look like what they are not, that is, funny? No. How come? And let me tell you why. Oh, good. Um, I get this. I do get it all the time. I get people who are going to be on Letterman or Lena, and it, it will be Hillary or or um, the Vice President uh, Al, I call him, <laughs> and or, or people like that. And and um, first of all, what I tell them is, uh, I give this uh, kind of pep talk to anyone I do this for, is that America doesn't want the funniest person in the world to be president. They just want to know that the president or the senator has a sense of humor. They just want to know you're a human being. So you don't have to go out there and do like characters. <laughs> you know, you don't have to be Robin Williams on the Letterman show. You don't have to be that funny. You don't have to, you just have to demonstrate that you have a sense of humor. So uh, that basically means that I become more of a facilitator to find out what figure out what's funny. And both those people, Hillary and, and the Vice President, happen to actually be funny people. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. And, um, and also, yeah, occasionally I'll write a line, especially if it's a gridiron dinner or something for Dashiell, I've done, and for Gore and for Hillary. Um, but to me, that's no more fraudulent than um, Michael Gerson, that's his name, right? Uh, the President's speechwriter writing the brilliant speech that he gave to the joint session of Congress. I mean, why, you know, why is it okay for President Bush to use a speechwriter and not okay for Al Gore to get a line from? A I have an answer writer? to that since you told me this five minutes ago. Because, yeah. And the answer is, and I, I think that when people try to read a politician, a public figure, they want to know. They 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 may know the person's not a great phrase maker, but a sense of humor is considered to be something inherent in your character, right? Isn't that your point, Helen, that if you meet a politician yes. and you find him humorless, you think what? I think sad. <laughs> Too bad. I think they really lack something in their character. Now, is that a fair judgment, Alan? If, are there not people you've worked with, let's say even I mean, in the Senate, elected people, who are gifted, who care mightily about issues, who are incredibly smart, they just don't have a sense they of humor? They take themselves too seriously. Well, maybe they just don't have a sense of humor. But, but how does this speak to my point? Because, because you are infusing does not Does anyone words. else have that question? <laughs> you won't in a minute. Um, because humor, unlike a notion of shaping ideas, is something that people, I think, think inheres in your character. Okay, I'll, let me... But so let you're me, giving them a character transplant. No, you're not, because you go on Letterman, it, it isn't like Gore is going to do a script that you wrote. He's going to be doing a back and forth with David. If the president... The president has to be funny 
at the alfalfa dinner, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, at the Radio and TV Correspondents' Dinner. He has to be, he, in, in the spring, he has more gigs than Mark Russell. <laughs> okay, now, so people write for him. Yeah. Yep. But it isn't like, oh, well, gee, the president... impromptu sense of humor. I'm sorry? I have, I mean, Kennedy had an impromptu sense of humor. Well, a lot of these guys I mean, do. It was, not, it was not set up, the things I remember. Those His clips were not... His comeback was so quick. I, 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 but some of them, but I'm sure the paraphrasing of his inaugural was written by a speechwriter. That could yeah. be. Well, the, okay. But I, I, I want to come back to this point. That's <laughs> <laughs> what's... He's getting away. I never did trust the man with a Harvard <laughs> education, and now I know why. Alan, Another the, Ari Flesher. He's trying to control us. The, um, <laughs> I'm often did you compared, compare me? Yeah, the, no, me, a Jeff. Me, oh, good. Phew. The other Jew. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I want to come back to this semi-serious question. Did you work with people, I mean principals in the Senate, who were gifted, great public servants, no sense of humor. I did, and they were always easy to overpower and debate or any other place. You could just get them. You just throw something in. They're 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 all buttoned down. They're they're they've got their script in their head, and you just do some absurdity. We want names. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, Franklin and I, what was that show you dragged me into? Oh, the Late Line. Late line. Well, we did have, that's where you portrayed me as this poor savager of the AARP, and I loved it. <laughs> uh, now, where were we? Yeah, Chuck Grassley. Two, yes, uh, uh, you can throw them off. Uh, humorless people uh, are easy to throw off. You can really bamboozle them. They How do they get elected, though? I mean, if, if we want our politicians to have a sense of humor, are there, maybe, oh, I'll really get you in trouble. Are there some states that require less humor <laughs> from their public figures than others? No, as I, I, everyone has a sense of humor, but when it's contrived, it doesn't work. Right. Indiana. <laughs> now, Homer Capehart, not funny. No. Evan By? Evan By, not funny. Sometimes they're funny and they don't know it. Nice guy. <laughs> Dick Luger, not funny. Dan Quayle, not funny. I make my point. I prove it. Okay. You know, if you... Th I'm right again. I, yes. <laughs> Al may be on to something, because if you throw in Iowa and Illinois, Dick Durbin, Pete Fitzgerald, Tom Harkin, Chuck Grassley, not funny. Perhaps states with I that begin with I <laughs> have no sense of humor. What do you think? Paul uh, Simon. I, I, Wyoming. Funny. Very oh. funny. <laughs> funny, funny man, Paul Simon. Well, the boat, huh? Have we stumbled onto a great secret of American Indeed, politics? Uh, you got the formula. Well, Helen would see, she'd see us all in various uh, stages, uh, doing the gridiron or doing those, the, those press club things. And the greatest, the, the greatest bombers, the people who just cratered, were the people who had a speechwriter who telling them to do some kind of humor, one of those A bad one. Just down the pipe. A bad, yeah. Because it wasn't natural, it didn't come off natural. Uh, Bill Bradley asked me once, he said, I got to go give a, and he, he and I came in together, wonderful friend, and he, he said, I got to go speak to the New Jersey Chamber and they want all humor. Now give me some of your good stuff. So I gave him choice, three choice ones. He came back, he said, they didn't work. I said, no, they're not yours. Now I said, tell me one that just kills you. And it was about when he was with the Knicks and this guy said, I'm going to give you a dog, but you don't, you know, something about, but if you don't score the next game, watch out for your dog, you know, or whatever. Something rather bizarre. I know the joke. It's a good uh, one, actually. Whatever it was. <laughs> no, no, it was it, not it, my joke. It was his, and he, and it killed. It, it knocked him dead because it was Bradley being Bradley telling his story. Can I tell the joke? It's a funny joke. It, tell the joke. I heard Bradley tell it. Is it yours? A guy sent him a letter saying, "If you play as badly as you did, la you know, if you keep playing this bad, I'll kill your dog." And and Bradley wrote him back saying, "I don't have a dog." And um, the next day, he got he opened up his front door, and there was a dog. It was like a gift. A dog. You got a, you got a gift, a, a dog. A dog won't hunt. I see your point, Alan. It has to be you telling the joke or it just... But it's not mine. It's Bradley's. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> One of the great natural ones was Dale Bumpers. Bumpers had the most amazing uh, old town, you know, country lawyer Southern. humor. Just blockbuster stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I, in thinking about this, I'm remembering seeing a woodcut in a New York newspaper 
in the, in the middle of the Civil War, and it goes like this. The, the figure of Columbia weeping is telling Lincoln, 10,000 dead at Antietam. And Lincoln is saying, that reminds me of a funny story. The point being that he was, he was severely criticized for having a sense of humor and telling stories in the midst of, I guess particularly in the midst of the Civil War. Which leads me to this not humorous question. We, we are in a time now that is a whole lot grimmer in a lot of ways than it was, say, two years ago, for all kinds of obvious reasons. Is humor still an effective political tool in a time when economically, militarily, people are much more worried than they were? Can it work? Or do you have to kind of put it on the back burner a little? I don't think you have to put it on the back burner if you have a real sense of humor. Not, but not, I don't mean mangling the English language or calling people nicknames because it's supposed to be so funny. Not funny. Who does that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to tell a, a couple of Please. about Kennedy. When I, uh, I first had the honor of closing a uh, presidential news conference, Kennedy, it was a Kennedy news conference, and uh, Kennedy was, it was getting time to close it off, and he got wound up in a, in a question that was very clear. He was searching for the answer, kept talking, hoping he f- hit on an answer. And I finally got up and I said, thank you, Mr. President. He said, thank you, Helen. <laughs> and once, uh, when in 1960, in November, on Thanksgiving Day, I covered uh, the Ann Street House in Georgetown, and, and President Kennedy was naming different members of the cabinet. But anyway, then he flew off to uh, Palm Beach, and uh, Jackie had come to the door with Caroline. And when uh, Kennedy left uh, the scene, then we all left. And uh, I, when I got home about 11 o'clock at night after, after dinner, I um, got this call from the office, get to Georgetown Hospital because uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. is about to be born or something to that. And anyway, the whole press car converged on Georgetown Hospital. And for 10 days, that's how long they kept a woman after a cesarean. And, and uh, Jackie was in the hospital for 10 days. And I was always there, and also Fran Lewin of Associated Press. So we were staking out. Kennedy would come to the hospital twice a day, and he would see me, and we always try to think of a president, uh, try to think of a question we could ask him. And I remember asking Kennedy, do you want your son to grow up to be president? And he said, I just want him to be healthy. But on the 10th day, I was assigned to go back to his N Street house because Kennedy was going to see President Eisenhower to get oriented on what it's like to be a president and, and hopefully to be told some of the deep, deep dark secrets of the nation. So I stood out in front of uh, the house. Kennedy took one look at me and said, you've deserted my child. <laughs> he had seen me at the hospital day after day. Yeah. And that's, you know, this was quick humor, unprepared. and. Uh, Are there people who... Uh, Alan, who are afraid to show a sense of humor, who you know have one and they won't, they just won't let it out in public because they think it's, I don't know, undignified or too dangerous or something? Well, you, you're, you feel vulnerable if nobody laughs and you're trying <laughs> to be humorous. Uh, I had a teacher in grade school. She said, Do you, have you, you figured it out, uh, Alan, uh, whether they're laughing with you or laughing at you, which is a very interesting thing and remember all humor comes from pain all humor comes from pain Danny Kay told me that one Uh, you can ask anyone with a great sense of humor how they got it and they used it as their sword and their shield that's how it works okay Um, I want to turn to the ideologue on the panel not you not you (laughs) You. <laughs> Tell me some funny conservatives, conservatives whose sense of humor you genuinely admire. Public figures or writers. <laughs> he can't do it. Okay, uh, Alan, are you, you're a conservative? I, I've always flunked the test because I was always pro-choice, so that I, I flunked Okay, the then test. rule him out. <laughs> it's too bad. That's right. Um... Yeah, I think uh, uh, Bob Dole, very funny man. Um, 
Bob Dole had, uh, we were talking about this, he, he, he had what I consider ironic self-distance, um, which is a horrible thing for a politician to have because um, a really good politician, another guy who had this is, is Bob Kerry. There was always sort of was viewing himself from outside, I felt, and looking at the irony of the process. And someone who didn't do that was Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was also always, you know, what he was saying, he believed. <laughs> and uh, at all times, <laughs> you know, was he was completely consonant with what he was saying. Uh, Bob Dole I once saw at uh, a pro conference, and um, they hated him. This is a Ross Perot people. Ross Perot conference in, in 95, and it was the year before he became the nominee, and it was sort of a, uh, a beauty show pageant. You know, all the potential Republican nominees came. And they just, Bob Dole stood for everything the Perot people hated, and he knew he hate, they hated him. And, and he had a speech, and at one point he says, now Bob Dole isn't perfect. And that, this is in the speech, and I'm reading along the speech, but he injects because he just couldn't, didn't like them he just, he just went, Bob Dole isn't perfect. Maybe you people are. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just went, God bless him, you know. And he, he just, uh, it, 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 he didn't use it to great effect uh, for, for his own uh, good, but he was really very funny. I remember something he did in one of the debates where a uh, lehrer cut him off and but didn't really cut him off. So it was like, and to buy more food, a more, and then Lair went, sir, your time, time is up. But he, he, he covered up food, and then he goes, so you can complete your thought. And he just went, food. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that moment? It was really, really funny. So he's, so he's funny, and Reagan was very funny. Very, Reagan was very funny. Um, as I said, when, when he got shot, it was like, not not one joke. Not he was like eight jokes. Yeah, well, I hope the surgeons are Republicans. Uh, you know, tell mommy I forgot to duck. And it was just like boom, 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 boom. And it was uh... no. He he. This I think that that point people have gotten. But there was one line he did. It may have been scripted. In his 88 speech at the convention in New Orleans, he was bidding farewell, and Clinton was the, in 92, sorry, 92. Clinton was the nominee. He'd come back. And he said, now, I see some people are talking about this fellow, William Jefferson Clinton, and they're comparing him to Thomas Jefferson. And then reaching back to, to Lloyd Benson's famous evisceration of Dan Quayle, Reagan says, let me tell you something. I knew Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson was a friend of mine. And Bill Clinton is no Thomas Jefferson. Now, I, I wrote a riff on that, that whole thing for Gore, which was, uh, they used it the gridiron. And Gore said, uh, this is my plan for the first debate. I'm going to throw Bush. I'm, gonna, I'm going to say something negative about his father, at which point I'm sure he'll, he'll defend his father. And at that point, I'm going to say, I knew George Bush. George Bush was a friend of mine. And you, sir, are no George Bush. <laughs> which I believe will hopelessly confuse Governor Bush. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so that was... <laughs> you know, considering those debates, he should have taken it. He should have done it. He should have done it. Uh, I once asked, um, I told uh, President uh, Reagan at a news conference, uh, so-and-so says, you're not a good Christian. He said, I turned my, the other cheek. <laughs> nice, nice. In terms of your work with other senators, this is a classic small group. In small group theory, you've got 100 people, 98 of whom I think or assume they should be president of the United States. If, is, is humor a leavening device when things get tough in a conference committee, when you're down to the short stroke, so to speak, when it's the end of session, when, you're, when things are really tough? Is humor something that most of you folks use to just kind of Smooth the troubled waters? It always works, and uh, one of the best ones uh, in conference committee was Mo Udall, ah. uh, and of course Mo wrote a book, Too Funny to Be President, but remember that Mo Udall, if he'd had about, I think, 30,000 more votes and about four other primaries, would have been the candidate for president instead of Jimmy Carter. 
And it was his humor that he insisted that brought him down, that they figured, and he told the barber shop joke, you know, the one he goes into the barber shop and, and in New Hampshire said, I'm Mo Udall and, and I'm running for president. And, the, and they all said, yeah, we were just laughing about that a few minutes ago. <laughs> and uh, that was... I that. can't forbear since John McCain devotes an entire chapter in his book to Mo Udall, two stories that he quotes from Mo Udall, one of whom may perhaps be a little... Oh, risque for this crap, but since John McCain told it in public, I figure I can. The first one was that when Udall ran for a position in the House leadership, and he lost, he, did. he got up and he said, I'd like to thank the 130 Democratic congressmen who pledged themselves to vote for me and the 60 who voted for me. <laughs> and then he said, I have now learned the difference, coming from Arizona, between a cactus and a caucus. In a cactus... All the pricks are on the outside. <laughs> now, this is me quoting John McCain, quoting Mo Udall. So if any of you have any problems, leave me. Well, up. he came out after a loss. Maybe it was the presidency, and he was very gracious. He told a few stories, and he said, but let's not, my, I want my supporters to know everyone should join together. The voters have spoken, the bastards. <laughs> that was Mo Udall. You know, I'm still trying to trace the providence of that, not to take anything away from Udall, who's one of the funniest men ever in public life, but Dick Tuck said that, the, the Kennedy prankster at a concession speech when he ran for state senate, years before that, and I'll bet, I don't know, maybe uh, Horace, no, Horace really died before the election. It couldn't have been him. I, love, I wonder how far back that goes. But Udall, I mean, there's a guy who whose sense of humor was as... He's also the guy, I'm sorry, who got up at a, one of these endless political dinners. I bet everybody's quoted that since. And he said after endless speeches, everything that can possibly be said has been said. It's just that not everyone has yet said it. So it <laughs> he also said that anyone uh, that thinks of running for president, you never get it out of your system except with embalming fluids. <laughs> That's wonderful. I love yeah. that. In an age when so many of these candidates, and I know this is going to sound like, you know, everything was better in the old days, and I don't mean that because politics was dirtier and more corrupt in the old days, but in an age when, when you can turn on a Senate floor debate or a political rally and everybody comes out looking exactly the same with the same hair and the same ties and the same suits and the same set of consultants who've told them to say the same 20 words, is political humor in some sense an endangered species? in the sense that you guys mean it, of a natural willingness to express yourself in your own words? Have, do, you, do you see that at all, that, that these guys are not willing to be as natural as they once were? I haven't heard anything funny lately. Well, <laughs> lately may be a trick. Well, then you haven't been listening to Chuck Grassley. <laughs> well, well, what Al is saying, though, one of the sad things, and I was one of the graybeards helping Bob Dole in his campaign, and the saddest thing was he had advisors that were telling him to dampen down his yeah. sense of humor and not use his sense of humor, which made Bob Dole uh, totally uncomfortable. He didn't come through in the campaign, and it was a shame, and he believed these cats around him. We, well, we, they were afraid he was going to accuse the Democrats of starting two world wars again. Now, why would a, <laughs> what, no, wait a minute. Okay. But why would a guy who has achieved what Bob Dole achieved, you know, one of the most beloved leaders of the Senate of any, I think, in this century, he was. probably would have won a closed secret vote for president, including half the Democrats, if they could have voted. They had the one one time, and he, he got 90 votes or something. Uh, so was, why would he listen to those people? Uh, wanted to win. They told him I, that was the way to do it, I guess. He complimented me on the gown I was wearing and said it came from J. J. Edgar Hoover's wardrobe. I remember in, in Iowa at some debate, uh, some little girl asked a question. And he said something. And you remember that uh, Phil Graham... Uh, at one point, maybe this was in actually, the, Graham ran 96, that's right. And Graham used to say, I flunked the third, seventh, and ninth grade. <laughs> and so some, um, some girl got up, you know, it was like one of these forums where they let little, little school children ask questions, and 
He and the gr little girl asked a question about education, and he said, "Now, what grade are you in?" She said, um, well, "I'm in third grade." And he, Phil flunked that, you know. <laughs> Phil, <laughs> and no wonder, or no wonder you can't answer that, Phil. You flunked that grade, or something. It was something like that, and it got a laugh, right? And but I remember, like, um, um, oh shoot, the uh, political uh, uh, Schneider, Bill Schneider, Bill Schneider, CNN senior political analyst. Yeah, uh, after the debate, going like. You know, did that play too rough? Some people might think so. Some people might say, that's Bob Dole's sense of humor, and that's good. Other people might think that was too harsh. And I'm sure Bob Dole's like watching this, on, you know, in his hotel room going like, ah, I better tone it down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was like, ah, shoot. See, I remember, <laughs> Okay. I actually remember the guy who I always think of in the Senate as having I don't want to use the word mean because it's too pejorative, but let's say acerbic, Mr. Hollings of South Carolina. In 1984, he was a very long shot candidate for president, as was Reuben Askew, the governor of Florida. And Reuben Askew had this unfortunate tick. Um, he would do this. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. The man was a one of the most beloved public figures in Florida, great senator. I mean, as honest as the day was long, but he did have this thing he did. And at one point, I don't know, these were not exactly the two front runners, but Askew said something critical of Hollings' position on something. And Hollings, who, as you may remember, is the absolute living embodiment of Foghorn Leghorn, Senator Claghorn. I mean, it's just a great. I say, action. sir. I say, I say, boy, I say. <laughs> and Hollings turns to him in a debate and says, that's not what I said, Reuben. You got a tick in your ear, too. <laughs> and I remember, you know, watching this and thinking, you know, I could see you doing that in a closed meeting in the USA, but this is a televised debate. You know, people see this. So I guess that's one case of a guy who. Uh, who Hollings see lost it. the crucial Tourette's vote. <laughs> um, I remember that. That was uh... <laughs> well, in the uh, one upsman. Uh, you know, up in up in New Hampshire, they got a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, you know, they yeah. play hockey. Hey, hey, watch it, watch it. Okay, ma'am. One upsman department. Uh, Everett Dirksen got his first limousine with a car when he became a leader, and he called uh, LBJ, who was also in his limousine, and he said, "Linda, do you know where I'm calling you from?" And <laughs> Johnson said, "Wait a minute till I got my other phone." <laughs> You know, about five minutes we're going to, you know, if any of you are foolish enough to have a question for these people, but we have mics there and there. Is that it? Two mics? Yeah, the uh, economy is not that good. They used to have four mics. But I, I want to I wrap up our part of this with a question that I've actually sort of been bothered about by humor, and it's not so much the humor of politicians but it's the humor directed at politicians, and particularly here by late night comedians. Mm -hmm. And I have this notion, I'd like to know what you think about it, that because of the nature of late night political humor, whether it's Leno or Letterman or Conan or, Stu or Exem Stewart actually, they seize upon the one most notable negative trait of whoever they're talking about, and they hammer it home night after night because that's what an audience that is not particularly politically hip will get. So, and, and these guys are defined solely by that trait. In other words, Al Gore, boring, a robot. Uh, uh, George W. Bush, an idiot. Bob Dole, senile old man. Quail. Bill Clinton, we don't even have to get into that. <laughs> and the question is, is there, some neg is there some unfortunate effect of that in which we've taught a couple of generations that none of these guys are anything but fools, knaves, idiots, horn dogs, or whatever. You want to put the late night comedians out of business? Perish the thought. I'm simply raising the question, does it have an impact on people's willingness to believe political leaders okay. when they're told night after night that they're a bunch of, sh of uh, schnooks? I, I, think, I think it has a big impact. And it is. I think what that helped? it was relentless on, on uh, Clinton night after night. Eight years, he never knew one moment when he wasn't being ridiculed and investigated. And you think but that, that wasn't 
solely the fault of late night comedy. <laughs> no. I, I mean, it wasn't the Conan investigations it wasn't were a very minor us. part of it, I thought. Uh, but it also was relentless. It never ended from the moment he stepped into the White House till he left. No, but, but I mean, it was also, let's face it, the news business, too. I mean, there, during the Monica thing, it was 24-7 Monica. There were some news organizations that did not succumb to that temptation. I like to cite them wherever I go. Uh, Sailing Magazine. <laughs> uh, American Grocer Monthly. <laughs> Jugs. Uh, and Big Butt, <laughs> which is ironic because I thought Big yes, Butt had a thank story. You. <laughs> there you go. I think, I think you know that uh, his, his business it depends on what it means. Uh, Alan, I'm going to, in the closing moments, drag this back to semi serious and ask you I mean, is it harder? Don't. <laughs> is it harder for anyone to take? these political leaders semi-seriously when they're being told in the most watched forums where we're told a lot of people get their politics from that there's nothing about them to be taken seriously. Well, look uh, to counterpoint Helen, look what they did to Dan Quayle day and night. And the day he put potato up on the board, the media was standing right there and it took him a half a day to find that the word was spelled wrong. And when they did, they just went <laughs> goofy. I mean, really, the thing was on the board, and they were sitting there, and for three hours, this sat on the board, and then they potatoed him into eternity. Um, but I tell people, and I really mean it, you can't hate politicians and love democracy. Better get it sorted out. You cannot, you cannot hate politicians and love democracy. That doesn't work that way. You can be as funny as you want. It isn't a question of hating them. It's a question of questioning them. Oh, no. No, there's a lot of disgust, uh, you know, that they're silly, stupid, banal. I mean, you have to admit that. You, you would, I know. Yes, Helen. I would. I know. <laughs> and I always say to the media, how would you feel if this were happening to you? And if you ever see the media we people shrivel, shrivel like a bunch of slugs with salt on them, it's when you say, how would you feel if feel this were I happening made. to you? like staking out your house, making fun of you day and night. And you ask that of a, of a journalist, and they'll say, that's not a fair question. That's, that's no, the chilling effect. No, but you go into public life, you're, uh, you're we, on camera. More you're people wired. know Helen Thomas than know 400 people in the U.S. Congress. That's the way it works. So you can't have that isolation. She's been you. around a lot longer. Sure. <laughs> but, you know, but, I, I agree. I actually agree with Alan. To, to some, I, I hate you, too. Uh, <laughs> but um, on the on the quail thing, I will say one thing. If Pat Moynihan had misspelled potato, it wouldn't have stuck. You know, I mean, you know, it was sort of like oh, Dan Quayle got unfairly labeled as not the brightest guy right out of the gate. Yeah. When you it kind of stuck for a reason. <laughs> it's true. It's like, when it's like Al Gore's little fibs. And that's true, because think about it. If Jimmy Carter had had oral sex with an intern in the Oval Office, nobody would have noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> I am just, I can't wrap my head around that even. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if he just had, you know, there it was like a just, you know, it was, there you it was go. JFK. So, I see your, I, sorry. All right, I forgot where I but was. But just be, but as we ask you to Perfect come to the mic and whatever it is you want to do with it, uh, I want to endorse Alan Simpson's point about journalists with a quote from Edward R. Murrow. We love to quote Edward R. Murrow about high and noble things. <laughs> Edward R. Murrow was the guy who said, journalists don't have thin skins. They have no skills. <laughs> and I think if you want to hear, and I'm, you know, that's what I've been doing for a lot of my life. If you want to hear people holler, they don't holler. Squeal, sorry. I'm not an, a farm guy. Like a stuck pig. You, mm -hmm. just, you just put journalists on the same griddle. And I think Alan's right. Public life, do people know uh, 
you know, Sherwood Bullard, or do they know Dan Rather? Do you think they, do you think they stop Larry Craig on the street, senator from Idaho, and ask for his autograph, as, as much as they do, say, Brokaw or Jennings or Apple? Bullard, a great Republican. Thank you. So I think that there's a, I, I do think there's a point there. Dan Rather never heard of him. <laughs> Sorry. Keep going. <laughs> Don't mind me. No, I'm just seeing the other side of involuntary civil commitment. You know, in law school, I, I had a whole different view. If you've got some questions, and uh, uh, please come to the mic. But please, since Helen alluded to Clinton's famous notion of definitions, a question is not a 30-minute speech followed by "Don't you agree?" Okay, just we'll, we've got time for some. So, what's your question, sir? Um, if perception is reality and perception is, give us an example which you found two or two in. Stay on the mic because I'm missing every other word. I'm sorry. I, I think it's the mic. Oh, okay. It's the um, mic. Can you give us two instances in which politicians or separate incidents had equivalent humor but were perceived differently and so the outcome was phenomenally different different I ask this pr primarily because I'm studying political communications and rhetoric at Emerson College and when I work on campaigns I really try to ask the candidates that I work for to sort of push the envelope in their communication because it's in a, a good speech that one is attracted to the politician, and I feel that politicians are concerned that they will be misperceived. So could you give us an example of that? All right. Anyone want to take a crack at it? I actually have, an, uh, have a possible one, but I, I'm the moderator. You got an example? Anybody? I'm not to totally sure I understand. Well, I think, if, I think the question is were, were two people <clears throat> who actually were on kind of the same, same level substantively or even even – had a kind of equivalent humor, but one of them managed to convey it, and the other, we got a sense that he was just not there. No. Look, we, no please, look. Jeff, help no, yeah, that the geez. perception, Jeff, the that man the wasn't perception saying that. of <laughs> their politics, liberal bias, conservative bias. Okay. The best, one still, of the examples that I can think it. of, which probably won't satisfy you, but frankly, at this point, I don't care, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is that... If you think about the 1960 primary between Kennedy and Humphrey, right? now, Humphrey had a pretty good sense of humor, but Humphrey's humor was intense. You know what I mean? It was like it was, he was a very brilliant guy, and Kennedy was a very cool guy. And I don't think anybody would have thought at the end of that that, that, that Humphrey had anything like a sense of humor because Kennedy's coolness, that kind of detachment, a little bit of the irony you were talking about, came through, I think, in a way that Humphreys did. It was didn't kind of was... Cary Grant versus Jimmy Cagney. Okay. I like that. That's great. That's great. That's perfect. You're done for the day. Take the rest of the day off. Sir. Um, just a question. Is this, do you think this is uniquely American? Let me, like, do Danish politicians yuck it up, or is it just something that we sort of expect? The, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know. I know that they have political satire in like those. Especially, they like puppets a lot. <laughs> and uh, no, they do. They have these um, latex um, images of their politicians. You mean in, spitting, spitting image. Spitting image in in Britain, but they have one in in the, in the right. Soviet Union, or well, the former. Soviet Union, uh, that was so popular that uh, I think they killed many of the people who <laughs> <laughs> who did it. And I think there's one in France. And uh... but here's but here is something I think that's linked up to a very big American tradition, and that is this country was born in rebellion against authority, and the tradition of making fun of politicians, uh, while it may have hit kind of a critical mass, there's a fella. Uh, Josh Billings, who wrote in the 19th century, uh, Artemis, War Artemis Ward wrote a piece on Abe Lincoln getting the nomination for president in 1860 that you could, you could have written it today. It's about these guys going to his farm in Illinois, telling him he's been nominated for president, and Artemis was making fun of Lincoln's images, the rail splitter. He was a corporate lawyer. And he has Lincoln sitting there 
cutting, he said, look, I, I made a promise. I got us with three million rails before sundown. Don't bother me with this presidential stuff. <laughs> um, it, it's a very deep-seated tradition here. I think, I won't say unique, but it is kind of different than any other place. We just love it. I mean, read Mark Twain on, on, a, on politicians. And who was it? Was it Artemis Ward who said, I'm not a politician and my other habits are good? <laughs> this is 150 years ago. In, in the wake of 9-11, uh, political satire and um, political humor kind of took a back seat, maybe rightly so, and it seemed to... Um, I'm sorry, can you, I, uh, the two of us here, seriously, have lousy hearing. Can you speak up louder? In the, in the wake of 9-11, political satire and political humor kind of took a back seat, maybe rightly so. Um, and then there was the controversy with politically incorrect and Bill Mayer, and I'm wondering if the board could kind of um, comment on that and whether that was justified. Uh, you're looking at me. Um, okay, a couple things. Uh, I'll, I'll go right to the politically incorrect. Bill, Bill Maher went on, uh, people know what we're talking about, right? Uh, he he uh, had the show Politically Incorrect, which is now off the air. Um, mainly somewhat because of this, but I don't think totally, there's a, I know a little bit more about that. For, when, when Politically correct, Incorrect went on the air several years ago, went on ABC, it was brought on by an executive who left ABC a month later. And it had no, Bill really had no champions at ABC, and Koppel didn't like the idea that it was following uh, Nightline and the ABC News Department didn't particularly like it. About a week after 9-11, he had his first show, and they were talking about the concept of whether the terrorists, the hijackers on those planes were cowardly. And... Um, so, and I think Dinesh D'Souza may have, a conservative uh, commentator may have said, well, they're, you know, they did fly, a I mean, they were courageous enough to die or something. And, but uh, Bill said something about, well, sending a cruise missile, a cruise missile from 2,000 miles to hit a target, that's cowardly. Okay. And I think, so what he was referring to was, he made it sound like what he was saying was our pilots who sent, missiles from 2,000 miles to bomb targets in Kosovo or somewhere, or probably, I guess, during the, if it was cruise missiles, must have meant Persian Gulf, were cowardly. Now, I don't think he put it right, but I think what he was saying is, in, like in Kosovo, we were dropping bombs from 30,000 feet, and we were killing civilians, innocent civilians, because we were not willing to take casualties. That was not cowardice on behalf of our pilots. That was President Clinton knowing that the American people were not willing to take casualties in Kosovo. And it wasn't even said funny. And by the way, what Bill Maher said inartfully and with a, with a wrinkle that was close to kind of just dumb was basically the criticism of Clinton that, say, John McCain has repeatedly made. So well, I, don't, I don't know if he was criticizing yeah, Clinton. It sounded like he was criticizing Pilot, but let me, let me say a couple things. One of which was people did not want to hear that kind of thing from a comedian then. Very ill time. But I think the sentiment behind it, the point of that show, politically incorrect, was to be able to say things like that. And it was just at a very sensitive time. And I think there was no reservoir of goodwill toward Bill for a number of reasons at ABC at that point. So they let him hang there. But... I went to Kosovo. I did a USO tour the next month. I was a few weeks later. And I said something that I think is, I, I, I said this to the troops there. I said, you know, when we, we were fighting here in Kosovo, American people were really worried about taking any casualties here. Uh, and as a result, we had to be very circumspect about how we conducted the war. You'll be happy to know that since 9-11, Americans are willing to take casualties here in Kosovo. <laughs> And they, they thought that was hysterical. They laughed. <laughs> and, but I was actually speaking to the same point. And he w it was really poorly, poorly put. But the, the fact of the matter that 9-11 changed so much, and one of the things that did change was the willingness of the American people to send ground troops into Afghanistan. You know, President Clinton has criticized a lot for not, having, not going and getting bin Laden. Well, the way to get bin Laden was the way we went and got bin Laden, although we didn't necessarily get him, but we may have gotten him. But the way to get him is you had to attack Afghanistan. 
And we're only willing to do that because we took 3,000 casualties on 9-11. Let me try to get a few more questions. In. Sorry. Unless, no, is there part two? We no, no, that was, I think that was several parts. Okay, yes. I, um, I've always been curious as to which groups of demographics you guys believe, I guess, are most responsive to political humor and which are the least responsive to political humor. Like, which groups of demographics of citizens oh, find it the funniest, which don't? Which demographics are most uh, uh, receptive to yeah. political humor and which are the least? Um, Alan, from your experience as a practicing politician, is there any demographic group that is less willing to hear humor? They all like humor? You either like it or you don't. doesn't matter where you're from or what country or whatever. It's humor. The Russians have great humor. They're very earthy people. I've been there about seven times. I love it. I wish I could speak it because they speak my kind of earth. <laughs> it's right down in there. Uh, uh, I don't. I, I don't think you. I think that's a stereotype that would be very unfortunate to try to even explain to anyone. But that young man deserves a better answer, uh, uh, at least one. You asked about perception. Uh, let me tell you, in politics, you're entitled to be called a fool, boob, screwball, idiot, bonehead. All that is fair, but never let them distort who you are. <laughs> and when you do, you're you're gone. And, and I had a rule, and it was a tough one. It's an attack unanswered is an attack believed. Furthermore, an attack unanswered, Bob Squires told me, an attack unanswered is an attack agreed to. And the people who are telling you not to respond are the people who love you the most. Your wife, your father, your mother, your children. And you wake up at 2 in the morning and say, wait a minute, that's my name. That's me that they're distorting and never let it happen. And I've watched great politicians go right down the tubes because their staff and everyone around them is saying, no one will believe that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, they will believe anything. <laughs> anything. I do, think, I do think there are certain audiences, and certainly in the East, that are more au courant to, to humor, to, to the kind of political humor that's going on. Yeah, but I, I mean, I know everyone, it's saturation bombing across the country, but I honestly think that, I mean, to read Maureen Dowd, you will have to have read many things and, and uh, to catch the humor. Uh, and in contrast, people like in Wyoming are just idiots. <laughs> I don't it's think a that's true funny. smart ass, and I told him that a long, long time ago. <laughs> Great A, smart ass. I was about to point out that Dale Bumper, cited by former Senator Simpson as one of the funniest men, ran in that Ocaron state of Arkansas. And as far as I know, telling, telling funny tales in rural America is one of the oldest political traditions there is. I think you go back to a gentleman named Davy Crockett. I didn't, I didn't mean that. So, I mean for the Ocaron, what's happening actually on the front On the other hand, don't well, try to be funny politically to a Japanese audience. I did it once. <laughs> it's a very big mistake. Or to the NAM. Very big mistake. I don't care what they pay you to go to Tokyo and give a political or talk. To the don't be funny. <laughs> I don't care what translator you have. I don't care. Don't do it. Russians, fine. I don't if, know from the Chinese. If you compare German. their prime minister to Godzilla, they just howl. Good point. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. They just they love it. <laughs> Next time, next time. Next time you write my material. <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, thank you. I, I wanted to hear from all of the guests today. Who are your favorite contemporary political commentators or humorists, whether it's, it's a columnist or someone on broadcast, who gets it right, who, who doesn't necessarily say they're all a bunch of boobs and has some, some insight to it? Good question. And they can be either like practicing politicians or writers. Can we do it that broadly? Okay, Alan, who do you who do you who makes you laugh? Mark Russell. Uh, Mark Russell has a gentle touch with his piano, and yet is an equal opportunity offender uh, <laughs> uh, with regard to not being that hard or that harsh. But how can the American people not have a view of politicians when when all the night shows are just making fun of them right and left? They're all boobs. They're idiots. And, and it's, it's a curious thing. Remember, do you remember when sure. Bill Clinton and Hillary had to go to the media and say to them, quit making fun of Chelsea? And they had little things on Saturday Night Live with buck teeth and all that. I mean, that isn't humor. 
That is crude stuff. And they can't seem to sort it out. Humor is not humor if it's just making fun of somebody else. If you're just making fun of somebody else, you're covering a lot of your own butt. That is not humor. People don't laugh at it very much. They, yeah. they laugh, but it isn't down here. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a, ha, yeah, ho, ho, ha, ha, like I better laugh. The, the, the meter is on. The, 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 uh, the laugh meter is on. So that's where I come from. I made a lot of mistakes, but you, you, that's not humor when you're just sh sh chopping somebody's shorts off and laughing to beat <laughs> the band. Who makes you laugh? You said Marine Dowd. Well, I think she's very funny, but, but uh, Sam Donaldson, and he makes me laugh <laughs> with all due respect. And I hate to do it, but I'll second what he said about Mark Russell. I think he was, he's great. Now, I'm going to cite somebody that, who got into a little bit of a contretemps with former Senator Simpson on our air a couple of years ago, but I do think that the political humor on Jon Stewart's show is of a particularly superior nature because he goes... <laughs> He doesn't do the obvious joke. He doesn't go for the, you know, oh, George Bush, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's down here. And the people who work with him, uh, his, his, his whole troop really gets it. And, they, and Alan, you'll be happy to know that they make as much fun of network TV correspondent types as they do more than they do about politicians, which is also great. Now, you know, Barney Frank was supposed to be here. Couldn't make it. I think Barney Frank is legitimately one of the funniest people uh, that there is. Um, he has a great delivery that that kind of that that semi lisp he has makes him sound funnier, even than his material. It is. It's like Jackie. Gale. That's that's because he's gay. <laughs> no, no, he is. No. No, I heard it. Um. You know, I was going to offer you a quip of, of, of his, but... Oh, um, sure, go. No, no. He wrote a letter to the New York Times in 1964 when Strom Thurmond flipped to the Republican Party, officially, and he said, we Democrats should always remember it is better to give than to receive. <laughs> you got to, you know, you, that, this is... This is yeah, he's very... He's a, a Barney he's Frank... Also, many of you, you know, in his first campaign for office, uh, local office, there was a picture of Barney in shirt sleeve, you know, just complete mess. Chinos, wrinkled, kind of, sort of. <laughs> and the slogan was, neatness isn't everything. <laughs> this is a guy who can laugh at himself. Yeah, he, he once said uh, you know, he's only voted for a politician once that believed everything he believed, and that was himself the first time he ran. <laughs> <laughs> so who makes you laugh beside yourself? Uh, I, like, um, I like Calvin Trillin a lot. He's, uh, I think he's a, a treasure. Um, I like Michael Moore. I don't agree with him on everything, but I think, um, I haven't seen the newest film either, but I'm, I hear it's really good. You know, I do think that he deals in polemics, and I think he's unfair sometimes. Uh, but I think he's really funny sometimes, too. Um, I like Jon Stewart's. I, I like The Daily Show a lot. Um, I like, uh, uh, boy, who, who else? Um, Chris Buckley. Chris Buckley. I, I haven't like read his, his new novel, but if you want to if you want to laugh your head and other body parts off, read The White House Mess, uh, this fictional memoir that he wrote about 10 or 12 years ago. About, um, Garrison Keillor, who sometimes oh, does, yeah. uh, but, sorry to interrupt you, but oh, White please. House Mess is, is, a, is a great thing. I think uh, a Parliament of Horrors, a, a very funny book by P.J. O'Rourke, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, wears a little thin. Now, before we get to um, this question, I'm going to throw you a curveball. <laughs> one of the funniest political novels I ever read, and no, it's not the one I wrote, <laughs> fine as that is, is a novel called The Floating Island by a guy named Garrett Epps. It did so badly, he gave up writing and now teaches law. It is set in the last days of the Carter administration. I don't know where you can find it. It's one of the funniest political novels I have ever read. Now, we're not talking about the Brits or the foreigners because we're talking only Americans. I'm telling you, that novel just put me away, and it sold about 800 copies. And now we're going to go to more questions. Um, yeah. Um, after 9-11, this online newspaper, The Onion, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it. Very, very familiar. Good, someone is. Great. The Onion always makes me laugh. 
Um, <laughs> after 9-11, it ran this issue. Um, I don't know if I can, I don't want to say the title, say what it was called here, you know, it's such a fine audience. <laughs> but um, how do you, I want to know how, um, from each of you, how do you think they handled the events of 9-11? Do you think they did it in a good way or was it just, you know, a little too harsh? The, uh, I, no. If I got it, and I apologize, the, uh, the way the Onion handled 9-11 was the single most brilliant thing I saw. They spent an extra week, they, you know, the Onion is a satirical weekly web newspaper. They are hilarious. I will just, they did a piece, they did a piece on Al Gore campaigning in Pennsylvania. This is a satirical paper. And the pro of the story is Al Gore went through Pennsylvania saying this is the pestilential hellhole of earth. I don't care if I lose all of your votes, if I never have to set foot in this repellent, <laughs> disgusting state populated by subhuman creatures, I will be happy. Anyway, after 9-11, they waited a week, and their headline was that um, hijackers are surprised to find themselves in hell. <laughs> that was I thought they funny. did a brilliant job. Yeah, it, the thing you're referring to is the headline, which was like, wasn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm going to say it. It wasn't like, holy fucking shit. <laughs> was the... Yeah, the thing. Was <laughs> it was sort of like that. And, that was their headline on the Man Lands on Moon, actually. Yeah. Was that the? Yeah, which is pretty um, nice. But yeah, they're, they're, they're great, and I thought what they did was, uh, was a great contribution. I thought Letterman's uh, for putting his foot in the water. And, you know, I, went, I was actually down at Ground Zero like a week after, and um, one of the firefighters there went like, when are, when are they going to start doing, like, Letterman and stuff? <laughs> he just went like, why, you know, it was a guy who lost, like, you know, four, four or five guys. From People did say after 9-11 that it was the end of irony, and, and it was the end of irony for about two and a half weeks. The and guy who said that actually was being ironic. Ah, there you are. <laughs> the, we'll take a couple more and then, right? right. Okay, the, go for it. Uh, <clears throat> to protect the American people, excuse me, uh, John Af uh, Ashcroft has been draping dirty statues in government buildings. And my question is, how long do you think it will be before he starts draping raw granite or trees that are growing to keep us protected? Thank you. Uh, well, you're, you're referring to this great thing he did, which was their, what is it, Lady Justice or something? Has, uh, it's this weird thing. It's, he's weird. <laughs> I mean, there's just no way. I don't think he should ever go to Rome. <laughs> well, he but if he went to Rome, he'd have just a permanent erection, evidently. <laughs> he's just <laughs> because evidently, there, so the, so he gives these press conferences, right, from from the Justice Department, and the camera position was such that in the shot, there is Lady Justice who has one bare breast. Right in the statue, so he spends, I believe, eight thousand dollars to drape Lady Justice so that we can't see her breast in the camera shot during his press conference. And if Clinton was there, they would have bared the other breast. So what's the? <laughs> okay. Um, Why not say, let's move the camera. <laughs> let's move the camera over here so that we don't see the bare breast and spend the $8,000 on a computer, you assholes. They don't, they have, their, their computers at the FBI can't do a Google search. They cannot do, they can't do two words. They can't do, uh, to do Al-Qaeda, they have to do Al. <laughs> They have to do. They have to. They come up with me, Al Gore. They have to go through. Every, they have to do every weird Al Yankovic song. Where, oh fuck, you know. And it's, you know, uh, if they, if if you're in the FBI and you just want at lunch for your own thing, want to look up hot, wet Asian girls, you got to go through hot, wet Asian girls. It's just crazy. Uh, Alan, <laughs> I'm going to cut through some of that. And he accuses me of getting down in there? Jeez. God almighty. I'd like to go back to the first part of that yeah, multi-part answer. Is, Al is John Ashcroft weird? Hmm? Is John Ashcroft weird? You served with him. I served with him. Uh, he seemed like a rather rigid kind of... 
He doesn't have to go to Rome. Yeah. Well, at least, uh, at least I'm trying to use English. Uh, um, he, he, he's, he was, he was very much who he was. He had very strong feelings about abortion. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't happen to agree with those feelings, but I don't know how you can continue to make fun of a guy that has his own principles. What the hell's wrong with that? Well, because now wait, I get my. Oh, okay. Uh, so, All right, and, and then he don't... joined the Singers Battalion there, and he was one of the four singing senators. And they had it, I can't remember what part he sang, but, but he, he w I happen to even believe that, uh, let's get right to it, that partial birth abortion is something I don't need to handle. That's for doctors. So I've been called a baby killer. He was, he was absolutely appalled when I voted to say, I think that procedure should be done by doctors and shouldn't even be in a legislative body. And he, and he just, he, he got teary. And, and to, to watch him, uh, then he went on, uh, he, he has a, a, a demeanor, which, which is a scowl, and he, and he knows that. I've heard him say, you know, I could smile a lot. Uh, to take an Art Deco figure of justice and drape it was absurd. Uh, and But, you know, again, back to perception. Doesn't matter how smart he is, they're going to just use that one on him now for the rest of his eternity, eternity like Potato with, you know, or Clinton with, you know, Monica and all the rest no, of we it. we got a lot more on him than that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wiretapping, accessing email, picking up Massive deportation, picking up people off the street if they have dark skin. Uh, come on. Well, How about the anointing himself with Crisco? Hey. You know, in my I mean, I mean, you know, what you said was, how can you attack, you know, go make fun of someone for their uh, who's principled? Yeah. Well, you, come on. I mean, if your principle with, includes you know. draping a breast. Well, that's one issue. You know, you've got one. You've got a hook now, and you're going to play with that okay. hook the rest yeah. of the day. Well, I was asked about Hook them in. You know, see how much fun you can make of another human being. How much fun is that? I, I think the people who fought well, his confirmation my are job. great. <laughs> it is his how job. would you feel if that were happening to you, Al? Oh, you should. Oh, Senator, oh we've, had, no. we've, had, we've taken this man over I the know, so have I. He no, no, no. I before. know. It's, a, it's, it's very legitimate. It's a very legitimate thing because, uh, you know, uh, it, just like journalists are thin-skinned, comedians can be thin-skinned too, and and I'm not. No, <laughs> but when many were, of them are. <laughs> when you were busted, and that's one of the great things. When about you got me. arrested for exposing yourself in Penn Station, you handled that. Yeah, oh god, I went I mean, right out of the way. He did. Yes, we got time for a couple more. Um, god I'm knows. From Connecticut. I teach high school politics, and I've got a couple students with me here today. Um, my question to you is: Sometimes I feel like. I have spoken above students. Is there any time, some classes, is there any time in your, like, election 2000 that evening that you felt like you were out of comedy or speaking above people at a time? Are you talking to me? <laughs> because uh, comedy, you mentioned comedy. <laughs> that, 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 do I, yeah, I mean, all the time, um, I, I try to do, you know, you're talking about the late night comics, and especially Leno and Letterman, and and they, they they they're working to a broad general audience, who mainly it's a, the the amount of political ignorance in this country is staggering. The amount of ignorance <laughs> is staggering. Um, you know, it's like 50 percent of college students can't find the United States on a globe. It's that bad, you know. So if you're, you know, so you can hardly blame Leno for doing a joke where it's the one thing you know about a politician. But, so yeah, when I'm when I'm working all the time, I try to find an audience that, um, you know, that it's nice when an audience like comes to see me, because then they're expecting they're usually a little bit more literate in politics. But then when you're on TV, I do, I do Leno and Letterman and, and Conan all the time, and you have to be very, very uh, smart about uh, your, refer your the, the, the references, and you have to sort of educate people sometimes to a joke as you do it. But everyone knows certain things. They know Strom Thurmond is old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? They, know? they know a certain set of things, and then you build on that. 
<laughs> you know, but yeah, it's, it's uh, something I think about all the time. You're never going to hear Jay Leno start a joke saying, did you see that mock-up out of the conference committee from Interior? I mean, did you see it? <laughs> Doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Actually, for, like, did a good one on that. Two, two more. I'm, a I'm teacher. sorry. I'm a teacher also. However, I teach seventh grade, and I wish my kids were here too, except some of you are here. And I sort of would like to know what, particularly Mr. Frank, and you will like as a seventh grader. <laughs> Uh, I, as a seventh grader, this might be hard to imagine, uh, that I had some difficulty with some teachers. Not me. But on the other hand, I had teachers who really liked me, and we would just um, sometimes joke between each other about the other kids. <laughs> You know what, there are two more of you there. We can, we have, if they're quick, let's take, yeah. you still want to answer a question or are you just kind of yeah. hanging? All right, you first, you, and then we're going to wrap it. Go ahead. Um, I hope I can take all of you back a few years in terms of television, um, back to the days when uh, television was pretty much in its infancy in terms of its uh, use towards, uh, towards generating political discussion. Uh, you might recall during prime time, around, sometime around the mid-60s, there was a show called Rowan and Martin's Laughing. And uh, there was a um, particular personality that appeared on the show. Uh, I remember first encountering him and under the Pat Paulson for President logo. Uh, here you had a comedian who was making the scene and creating some stir among the populace, including people as young as myself at the time, who uh, were, uh, were led to believe that perhaps Pat Paulson would be a serious candidate. <laughs> It was okay. I'm not sure what election this yeah. was, but uh, I do recall, and uh, children around me were saying, "Yeah, it's Pat Paulson running for president." I'm sorry. What was the end of that? Uh, do we remember when Pat Paulson ran for president? Yeah. And and our our reactions to it. Pat Paulson ran for president. Uh, actually, yeah, uh, the actually had a comedian uh, running. Sorry. He, I mean, the, a comedian in prime time who was uh, had no qualms about pulling pulling. Uh, but no, hold, no holds barred comments about the various candidates running for presidential. I don't even, I mean, it was a joke. <laughs> he, was a, he was a Smothers Brothers figure who ran for president in 1968 and then, very sadly, kept running. He didn't know that his 15 minutes were over. Pat Paulson was out there for, remember that, Alan? He was out there for campaign after campaign and it wasn't funny anymore. How about Harold Stassen? Harold Stassen, yes, he was Pat Paulson. Had that Harold became Stassen. funnier. That's right. <laughs> um, actually, the, yes, that did happen. And the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour was a kind of a very unusual moment in that a major network in prime time on a Sunday night put people on with a very pronounced political view. And ultimately, it proved to be impossible. I mean, the tension between CBS and the Smothers Brothers when they wanted to do things like salute war protesters and... Um, celebrate marijuana, Pete Seeger, on. Pete Seeger on singing Waist Deep in the Big Muddy. Right. One of the great things about cable is that it does provide a niche where you don't have suits on, in New York Tower saying, we can't do that. We, you know, John Stewart could not survive on a broadcast network. Um, John Stewart would be canceled in six weeks. But he's on Comedy Central, and, and it works. Uh, let's take a last question, and then if anybody has a last word, we'll do it, and then we'll adjourn. Sir. So uh, do you think political humor has ever really uh, changed the direction of debate or sort of had real content, or is it really only good for earning charisma points? Wither political humor. What? Oh, uh, it will win debates. Uh, I remember uh, one of my campaigns where this guy said, uh, you know, Simpson's hiding something from us. Uh, and we know he had. I had told him I'd been on federal probation for shooting mailboxes and slugged a cop one night, and that wasn't enough for them. <laughs> Uh, but I got that out there before the media got to it, because they would have loved to have gotten that before I let it out. You know, geez, I just, they were just losing their marbles. Trying. But uh, this guy said, I want to tell you that uh, he, he says he's a native of Wyoming, but he was born in Denver. And I went, oh, my God, how did you find out? <laughs> that was the end of that. 
you know, and I made all sorts of faces and ran around. I always was in trouble making faces. You can be in a lot of trouble. And, of course, the worst one, Helen was there. I said, you know, you're just trying to stick it in his gazoo. And I went, hee, 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 like that. <laughs> and uh, Helen said, that was a nice face that you did there. But uh, I think repetition also. There he goes again. Uh, if you keep repeating that, it becomes very funny in the inner speech. Or, or you know, the, I paid for that microphone. That kind of thing is. The, I just the think that it is. I just think it is. Whatever else it is, for, it is for a political figure, such a powerful device. That's what I said at the beginning. It is like nitroglycerin. You got to know how to use it. You got to not be tempted sometimes to be the funniest guy in the room. <laughs> because well, that's a big you, you know you know what's but it's going to I mean and I you know if 911 didn't it put a temporary stop to it you know for a while jokes about the intelligence of the president weren't so funny when it was going to be up to him to protect the country from horrible things we lo- you know the, the luxury of that kind of humor was temporary but it's back it's back in full blossom and it's probably at some sense Alan a healthy thing that's I fair. mean well, I think that's so um you know, watch Saturday Night Live uh, to see the latest example of that this Saturday. I, uh, I just thought of something, which I th- uh, because the last election was so close, you can point to a million things that changed the election one way or the other. There was one moment where I thought Bush showed a sense of humor that probably, uh, do you remember <clears throat> in the last debate, I think it was the last debate. It is. This uh, is my Gore point. came, uh, w- it just got to invaded his private space. Excuse me. I've studied the tape. Okay. You you want to be Bush? No. You. I'll can either be what? Who do you want to be? I'll be I'll be uh, I'll be Bush. Okay. Okay. So so Bush Bush is like answering a question, right? I need to tell you in my widely unread book, Oh Waiter, One Water of Crow, I learned this had been diagrammed out by the Gore campaign staff that he would invade Bush's space. To prove to America how much taller he was, and this is what happened. But, but, and then, then I, uh, 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 I, I heard from the Bush people that they anticipated this. But this is what, this is so weird. But this is what Bush did, and I, I probably won't do as good a take as he did. But he did a thing. He's talk, He's answering a question about something or other, and I can't remember what it is. So, and I can't remember the thing. And he's talking, he's talking, and you got to get a little, even closer. Oh, that's about it. Yeah, that's about it. And he's talking, and he goes like this. <laughs> and then does that. Now, you remember that moment? Yeah. That was now, the whole that, debate. That was it. I mean, Gore walked like kind of, you know, Boris Karloff in a bad remake of Frankenstein. Bush looks over his shoulder, and it's just like, oh, hi. Yeah, he went, hi, how you? And it was... Bush did, if you look at that, Bush did a very funny take. And it just, boom. It just, everything, you, it, first of all, strange, Gore <laughs> coming over. And secondly, Bush's reaction uh, was, was really funny. And as I said, that election was so close, you could, there are a million things. Uh, if someone farted at a get out the vote <laughs> rally in Gainesville, uh, the night before, and the few people left, that might have done it. But that, that, right? A butterfly flutters its <laughs> wings in the Andes, and trees fall yeah, apart. Yeah, Yours yeah. is a little earthier, but it's the same yeah. idea. Yes. So that's my example. There you go. <laughs> of the moral of that thing. story, my friends. Don't ask that question. Is if you're ever in a debate for President of the United States, don't stalk your opponent. <laughs> Come back. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the time.